This uh, morning scripture reading comes from the book of James, starting in chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you? Who are you to judge your neighbor? From chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover a multitude of sins. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Children are dismissed if you would like to head out to Children's Church. Everybody familiar with this? I had a different sign up there that said judgment-free zone, but Pastor Greg said I had to give you the official Planet Fitness one. I don't go to Planet Fitness. <laughs> I don't work out, so I'm unfamiliar with this concept. But I bet you know, uh, have heard this particular phrase, uh, that uh, this should be a judgment-free zone. Who, who are you to judge me? And I find, I, I imagine that a lot of us as brothers and sisters in Christ, when we enter into this space, we think this should be a judgment-free zone. That church should be where judgment ought not to happen. And don't get me wrong, there's some judgment that I think has no business in church. However, I think we are called to judge. To judge in very real ways. To judge one another. Just maybe not to judge the way the world describes judging. I think that we are invited to judge one another as a people who increasingly look like our Savior. To judge one another in a way that we're going to talk about today is the difference between pushing and pulling. The difference between saying, I push you away because of your sin, or I'll pull you near to try to rescue you from that sin. So to look at this, let's jump in to where James does, to what Eric just read for us. We're looking at uh, verses 11 and 12 of chapter 4 and 19 and 20 from chapter 5 because on face value, they sure sound like they contradict each other. You know, on face value, verse 11 of chapter 4 says, don't slander one another and don't judge one another, right? This is people's favorite verse to go to. Uh, anytime someone is looking at me and saying, hey, I think what you're doing doesn't match with the will of the Lord. We look back at each other and we say, and who are you to judge me? James says, you can't do it. <laughs> but then chapter 5 says, if a brother or sister is wandering from the truth, right? if a brother or sister is walking off the path, which implies that I'm looking at said brother and sister and going, path, you, not same. That's a judgment. James says in chapter 5 that if I look at my brother or sister who's wandering off the path and I go to them and I rescue them, that that covers a multitude of sins and will indeed save them from death. It looks like James got a little bit confused. And it must be that we need to understand this better. So let's start here. James does say in verse 11, brothers, and we talked about this last week, right? Ladies, we're in there too. Brothers and sisters... Don't slander one another. Anybody who slanders a brother or judges them, and then we'll finish the statement here in a minute. But first, let's unpack these words. Uh, and to do so, because yesterday Eric sang me a Tupperware song, I have a new prop. <laughs> I, knew, I knew he would be impressed. It has a point, I promise. Slander. Right, the word for slander, when we think about it in uh, our culture, our language, and in our court system, the word slander there would mean I said a lie about you, right? I, I've, done, I've spoken something that you did not do and is not true. And slander can mean that. Uh, slander can mean that brothers and sisters, because that's who James is talking to, that people in a church look at somebody and they spread lies. And 
I hope that you've never experienced that. I know I have, right, where people have looked at me in the church and they've said I did things I didn't do or I was things I'm not. But a lot of times, slander is not about a lie. Christians are too good for that. A lot of times we slander each other with the truth. You know what I mean? I can slander you with the truth if I speak out loud what is actually true about you. It is your sin. You know, it's when I look at somebody and I say, that person, they're a liar. And maybe they do lie. Maybe they have lied. Maybe I even caught them in a lie. But I slander them if all I will do is say, that's who they are. They're nothing more than a liar. And it's 100% true. It's just skewed. And the thing about slander is that what slander ends up doing, it'll make sense later, I promise, is it creates, oh, I'm messing with the live stream people, it creates division, right? If I slander you, if the only way I talk about you, if the way I think towards you, if the way I act towards you is to say that's who you are, I keep you at a distance. I guaranteed to push you away. And that's where judgment comes in. There's two different ways, at least two different ways, that you can talk about judgment uh, from this particular word in the Greek language. Uh, One is to look at something and just make a judgment. You know, I look at something and I say, uh, that's good or that's bad, that's right or that's wrong. That's the judgment. Humans were meant to do that. You're made in the image of the judge. It's your job, and you're in Jesus Christ. We're called to look at one another and say, that is going to bring life, that's going to bring death. That's a judgment. It's a moral evaluation. But there's a different kind of judgment. There's a judgment where I look at you and I judge you based off of that true fact about you. I say, you are your sin. And you're never going to change. And you're not going to get any better. And that's the only way I'm going to interact with you. And when I do that, it's as good as picking up a big old piece of wood between you and me and saying, you will stay over there. If I made Steve stand up and I started coming near him with this, what do you suppose he would do? I hope he would back up. (laughs) We have a a problem if he does not. (laughs) My judgment of him, my slandering him, even with the truth, is only ever going to push him away. Does that make sense? And here's the deal. Most of us in churches, uh, sometimes, sometimes, we do this in a very melodramatic fashion. In my last congregation, I had two women. They were slandering each other. They were doing both versions, imaginary and real, right? They were spreading rumors that weren't true, but they were also saying, that woman always... Listen, nobody always. And they did it in the most melodramatic fashion known to humanity. They would show up on Sunday morning, and one of them would stand at the pew where the other one was and huff and puff till the whole room knew they did not like that person. Occasionally, we're melodramatic. Most of the time, though, we just do it in our minds. We do it in our hearts. I'll sit in the pew with you, but there is this equivalent between me and you, where I'm not going to let you near, and you're not going to get near me, and I will never think anything other than you than the thing you did wrong. That's slander. That's where I judge you, and I say you will never be anything more than this. And friends... Brothers and sisters in Christ do it to each other all the time. We do it in our minds, we do it in our hearts, we do it in the way we talk about that person, where the only thing we have to say is their sin. And you know it. We go to dinner with our friends from church, and we're talking about life, and then we happen to start talking about so-and-so. And the only thing we have to say about so-and-so is, ugh, every time they... And we push them away. Push them in our hearts push them in our minds, even if we'll give them a big old hug on Sunday morning. This is a problem. And what is interesting to me, I'm going to go back up here, live stream person. What's interesting to me is that James doesn't say it's a problem because, hey, Christian, you should be nice. He says it's a problem because when I slander a brother and sister in Christ, I slander the law of God and I slander God himself. Did you catch that? So let's finish the phrase. James says, brothers, 
sisters, don't slander one another because anybody who slanders a brother or sister judges them. And any, or judges them, excuse me, slanders the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping the law, you're sitting in judgment on it. Now, a lot of our English translations obscure this a little bit, but if you look at it in its original language, he, he literally takes the same words. Because if you slander another person, you, you push them away, it's only ever going to define you by your sin, he says, then guess what you're doing? You're slandering the law. And when James talks about law, he doesn't mean uh, the entirety of the Old Testament law. When he talks about law, uh, he describes it in chapter 1 as the royal law. He's saying the law that's meant to govern our existence as citizens of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus talked about the law, he summed it up as two things, right? Love the Lord your God with everything you have and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I think that part in particular is what James is getting at. You know, he finishes this section, verse 12, by saying, who are you to judge your neighbor? Because it's in the back of his mind, right? That we as brothers and sisters, that neighbor love had better begin here. And you know what? Loving your neighbor is not ambiguous. It's also not ushy-gushy. It's pretty concrete. The command to love your neighbor starts, is found for the very first time in Leviticus 19, verse 18, that you are to love your neighbor as yourself because I am the Lord. Now, when Jesus talks about it, right, and he, they said, what are the greatest commandments? And he said, love God and love your neighbor. His original hearers knew the context. So they knew where the command to love your neighbor begins. You know where it starts? So you just back up a couple verses in Leviticus don't go about spreading slander among your people. So that means that if I'm going to love my neighbor, I can't slander them. I'm going to love a brother and sister in Christ. I cannot either spread lies about them or skew the truth or only fixate on the sin that is present. Because when I do that, I start to do things that endanger my neighbor's life. Now, we'll talk about this more, but at the very end, chapter 5, James says that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death. Because sin in our life is always bringing death. If it doesn't bring literal death to my physical body, it'll bring death to relationships. It'll bring death to community. And if I stand back and the only thing I have to do about your sin is point it out to you from a distance, but trap you in it, then I'm endangering you. And that's called not loving my neighbor. If you were to keep going, right, it says, don't hate your brother in your heart. The hate just means to create a separation. I can hate people who I smile at, but you will stay there, and my heart will never go any closer to you. Don't hate your brother in your heart. Instead, rebuke your neighbor frankly so you won't share in his guilt. Uh, the Hebrew there is pretty ambiguous, but it, it means something along the lines of uh, both being willing to look at someone in their sin and confront them with it so they won't stay in their sin. But it also means that if there's something between you and me that's the reason I'm slandering you, I need to talk to you about it. So I'll stop hating you in my heart and endangering you and slandering you. The last thing he says is don't seek revenge and don't bear a grudge. The thing about slander is it's always revenge-based. Always. Because it's about punishing the other person. If I'm not out to punish you, then I don't need to tell other people about your sin. I would keep that little tidbit to myself. But if there's a grudge in my heart then I'm going to push you away and I'll slander you with every opportunity I get. Can you see it? James says, if I slander a brother or sister in Christ, I slander the law. Because here's the irony. While I'm standing here pointing out your sin, I'm breaking the law. I am walking in sin. And it's like I'm looking at you and saying, well, the law applies to you and you're breaking it, but I'm above it. 
But we don't just slander the law. We slander the lawgiver. Very next verse, James says, there's only one lawgiver and only one judge. <laughs> and I'm not him. And that lawgiver and judge is the one who is able to save and he is able to destroy. Christians, when, when I stand here as your sister in Christ and I slander you, then I slander my God. First, I slander him in his position because I act like I get to do his job. You know, I am called to judge um, in, the, in the desire to look at someone and say that is of the Lord and that is not. That is right and that is wrong. That is good and that is evil. I am not called to stand back and say, therefore, I understand your heart or I know your motives. Because that's how slander often goes, right? They're a liar because they're selfish. They don't know. They have no clue what your story is. When I stand in the position of my God, then I look at somebody else and I decide I know the verdict and you're guilty and you should be punished. So I slander him. But I don't just slander his position like by trying to take it. I slander his person, his personality. And I am made in the image of God and so are you and I'm in Christ and if you know Jesus then so are you and so that means that part of our responsibility to each other is to put Jesus on display. This is not Jesus on display. Right? He doesn't come to you and I and say I see your sin and I will push you away and back you even further into it. I was thinking this week and I was praying about how I do this. And there's a song that came to mind. I don't know if uh, you've heard it. It's an older one. It's by a group called Shane and Shane, right? Guess what those two guys' names were? Yes, they're very creative, right? Shane and Shane. Shane and Shane wrote a song called Embracing Accusation, and the whole song, whole first several verses of the song is them just saying, Satan is singing over me. And they, they say earlier in the song, Satan's singing over me the song of the redeemed. And they said, Satan is singing that I can't be saved, that I'm not good enough, that I deserve to be punished. Right? That's the song. It's very cheery. And then you get to the last verse. And they say, oh, the devil's singing over me an age-old song that I'm cursed and I'm gone astray. He's singing the first verse so conveniently over me. But he's forgotten the refrain. Jesus saves. If I look at a brother or sister in Christ, I look at you, and all I do is sing the first verse over you. All I do is point out your sin. All I do is label you by it. All I do is limit you to it. Then I don't sound like my Savior, but I sure sound like Satan. I'm singing the first verse, but I've forgotten the refrain forgotten the hope that is ours in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if I do what James says, if, if I'm standing here, friends, slandering you, slandering the law, and slandering my God, then I have to agree with James. Who am I to judge my neighbor? You know that image that James gives us here. It comes straight out of a, a beautiful, powerful illustration that Jesus gives, right? James, we've, we've said before, it's almost like he's got the Sermon on the, on the Mount. He's got Matthew 5 through 7 uh, right beside him as he's pinning this letter. And Matthew 7, Jesus teaches and he opens it with, with everyone's favorite sentence to misquote and misapply. Don't judge or you will be judged. And Jesus means it. He means don't judge the way James is talking about. But he gives an illustration. It's a powerful one, isn't it? I bet you know it. In the illustration, Jesus says, this is what this kind, the slanderous judgment look like. He says, it looks like you and I have a beam coming out of our eye. And when he says beam, you need to think bigger than this. Uh, because the word for beam describes the support beam for a house. So think something very long and very wide. Think telephone pole. 
growing out of your eyeball, okay? Jesus says, imagine that you get this beam coming out of your eye and you see your brother or your sister over there and they get a little bit of sawdust in theirs. Now, you ever get sawdust or something like that in your eye? It doesn't tickle. Matter of fact, you get a foreign object in your eye, it can cause serious damage, and it definitely hurts and is incredibly irritating. So don't misunderstand him on that point. But Jesus says in this illustration, how silly would it be if you've got a beam in your eye and you're looking at your brother with sawdust and you say, hey, I can see that sawdust. You need to get rid of the sawdust. Actually, come here, I'll help the best that's going to happen is the person with sawdust will run so as to not get clocked in the head by my beam. But there's no way I can get close enough to help because my pride and my self-righteousness and my ego and my sin are in the way. Who am I to judge my neighbor? If I'm standing in judgment over the law of God and refusing to love my neighbor the way I'm commanded to and refusing to illustrate the beauty that is my Savior. Now, before you and I are able to actually look at each other and have a community that's marked by lovingly judging one another, we need to be judged. Because something incredible happens when instead of looking at the sawdust in your eye, I acknowledge the plank in my own, and I say, Jesus, I can't remove it. I can't love that person. They irritate me. I can't see anything other than their sin. It's the only thing I've talked about. It's the only thing I've felt for so long. Something amazing happens, friends. When I say to Jesus, there is, in fact, a beam in my eye. Do you know what it is? He comes and takes it. He says, I will pull the beam out of your eye. And he's the same Savior who doesn't just pull the beam, but you might remember was crucified on it. You know that, right? That when you and I begin to actually grasp the reality of how much we've been forgiven, we begin to grasp the fact that we come at our Savior like this and he doesn't push us away. He removes the plank and then he pulls us closely enough that with his grace and his love, he can transform us. That's what our Savior does. He doesn't push. He pulls. He pulls us in close because he's already taken the sin and he's already paid for it. When you and I understand that, then, and only then, are we able to finish what Jesus says in Matthew 7. Nobody ever quotes it to the end. (laughs) Jesus says that once the plank's been removed, then I'll see clearly enough to remove the speck of sawdust from my brother's eye. I'm expected to judge your sin, and you're expected to judge mine. But I'm not expected to stand over here at a distance and push you away. I'm expected to let Jesus deal with the sin in my heart that is incredibly present. I'm expected to allow him to soften my heart with his grace and his gospel. And when he does, then I can look at my brother and sister in Christ and say, I I see the sawdust. I see the sin. And I know you're presently trying to cover it up. (laughs) I know you're trying to limp along. Like, it'll be fine. I'll get Visine. I know it hurts. Can I come close enough to help you pull it out? What would happen in a church that actually did that? A church that was so filled with people, so humbled by grace like we talked about last week, that we honestly began to look at each other and instead of saying, I'm going to slander you for your sin, I'm going to push you away, we started to look and say, your sin's not different than mine. We started to look at each other instead of excusing our sin. Oh, it's just sawdust in your eye. We looked and said, I know that hurts. 
I, I know that the, the bitterness in your heart has got to be spilling over into your family. I, I know that that little bit of sexual sin is going to cause damage down the road. I, I know that the sawdust, that little bit of sin, is doing damage. What if we loved each other enough to pull each other close enough that we could honestly look one another in the eye and say, listen, I've had a beam pulled out of my eye. I know what Jesus can do. and He'd love to rescue you from that. Wouldn't that be a different conversation? <laughs> Instead of the dinnertime chit-chat where we're pushing away the people in church that we say, I can't believe they did that. We're praying for them. And we're building relationships that are close enough that we can be in a position to help one another be set free. That's what James is talking about in the end, friends. If one of you should wonder from the truth and someone should bring you back, one of you should get sawdust in your eye and someone should pursue you and go after you and get close enough to you to say, hey, you've come off the path and you're going to get hurt. Remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. He's not talking about whoever saves somebody who doesn't know Jesus. He's saying whoever will come alongside someone who's already in the family and pull us back. There's way too many churches, way too many churches, where all we do is push each other. But we're called to pull. So here's the homework. What would it look like, friends, if you and I were humble enough to stop pushing We chose to get close enough to the judge, close enough to our God, to let him show us the beam in our own eye. But that's where this always starts, right? My ability to pull you close to the Savior is 100% contingent on my willingness to let my judge show me my sin. And then to let him remove it. Let him take away the guilt, the shame, but the sin itself. And then once you've done that, Maybe it's time we start pulling. (laughs) Or we actually recognize that love looks like seeing the speck of dust and pulling our brother and sister close enough to us that we can bring them with us to the cross so they can actually find healing. And I guess here's the real underlying question to that is, are you close enough to anybody in this body that you can see the speck of dust in their eye and they can see it in yours? Are you close enough to anybody that you can pull them even closer And together, rather than pointing fingers and pushing each other away, we can pull closer to our Savior. That's what Christian community is meant to look like. You know, the world is waiting for people who say, this is a judgment-free zone. We won't push you out the door. But we will pull you close because we want that speck of dust out of your eye just like we would want it out of ours. Let's pray together this morning. As you come before the Savior this morning, if you need to come acknowledging that there's somebody in this body right now that you've been pushing away, and you're slandered to them in your words, in your mind, in your heart, and you need to confess that before the Lord, then, then do that. And if you're ready to come before the Lord this morning and ask Him to judge you, so you can actually be used in a way that empowers the gospel to judge others? If you're ready to come and say, Lord, pull the beam out of my eye so I can be of help to my brother who's got the sawdust, then come and ask him that this morning.
Jesus, I thank you that there is, there is a first verse that you sing over us the reality that we cannot be saved on our own, that we are sinners, that there's a plank in each one of our eyes. I thank you that there is also a refrain, that you're the one who saves. And you don't push us away, you pull us close. You pull us so close that we would know your love and your grace and your power. We know your ability to remove the beam and therefore we know your ability to remove the sawdust. More and more, Jesus, may we be a church that less pushing people away from us because of their sin and more pulling each other close, close to the heart of our God, close to the cross, close to where healing can take place. Jesus, thanks for loving us. We pray these things in your name and all God's people said.